for attending. Um, I'm really excited to tell you about this project that we did in, uh, at my school. We, um, I'm, I, I want to give you a little outline of my talk. I'll be um, giving you a, a summary of the, this pilot program that we started in the spring 2012 semester at Cal Maritime in a four-unit course, an information literacy course. We repeated it in the spring of 2013. So I've got a couple semesters worth of experience with this. I'm going to describe to you what we did with using Wikipedia in the classroom. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit, a little overview of um, some areas where I see the values of Wikipedia overlapping actually, kind of surprisingly, at least to me it was surprising to see some of the overlapping values of Wikipedia with traditional scholarship. And then finally, I'll share our assessment that we did of the first semester of the pilot project. I have some data, some assessment data, and, and some, a few anecdotes to tell you about. So um, this class where we did this pilot is called Lib 100 Information Fluency. This is my chart that describes basically what we do in the class. Um, it's a combination of um, we, we definitely covered the five ACRL standards um, in previous semesters as well as the Wikipedia semesters. Um, and we have a computing uh, component as well, which includes um, uh, students working with Excel and um, some other programs. And, and the Wikipedia assignment um, definitely had a little bit of HTML co coding that I would put in the computing category. So um, basically, in a nutshell, what we did was instead of having a final assignment in which students did an annotated bibliography, which we had done in previous semesters, we had students contribute to a Wikipedia article that they had identified as needing work. Um, and the requirement, um, at least in my section, was that they contribute 1,000 words. Um, and of course, they had um, their sources cited at the bottom as well in APA style. So this is, this is the nutshell version of what we did. So I'd like to explain this term I used in my title, which was authentic, um, or talking about Wikipedia as an authentic learning um, environment or platform. Um, th this notion of authentic audience is probably familiar to um, folks who work in K through 12. That's when I did some research on the on the this concept. It seemed like most of what I read had to do with um, the K through 12 environment and assignments that have an authentic audience. Um, what I mean by that is um, uh, an authentic audience is typically someone other than the teacher. So if a student does work that isn't just uh, seen by the teacher, it's, um, whether it's written work or some sort of other project, um, it's seen by an audience um, presumably usually outside the classroom. Um, oftentimes it's a task that it's in conjunction with a task that fills a genuine need. So it's not just for learning, but it's also accomplishing something that needs doing. I have a couple other examples to tell you about. We did our Wikipedia assignment um, in the context here at Cal Maritime with a faculty learning community that was focusing on authentic assignments and assignments with an authentic audience. And some other examples of this is an economics class in which um, students uh, prepared for a debate uh, related to the presidential election and their audience in this case was other members of the campus, other, you know, it was still sort of contained within the campus, but it was presumably an audience of, of people who were making up their minds or, or uh, about voting. Um, another example um, came from a more upper division class related to a, a solar charger that um, was designed by engineering students um, that will actually be used on the campus. So these are examples. Um, from other areas outside of information literacy um, where assignments have an authentic audience um, uh, and are, are, would be considered authentic learning. Okay, so another sort of contextual thing I wanted to share with you is um, that we chose to join an official program that Wikipedia sponsored. Wikipedia is run by a nonprofit called the Wikimedia Foundation, and for several years they've had a um, an education program that started with graduate courses in public policy in the fall of 2010 where they provided what they called ambassadors to faculty who were willing to assign Wikipedia articles to their students um, with support from, from the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, so this started in fall 2010. Um, in the 2011-2012 uh, years, I, I went back and kind of looked at their documentation anywhere from 22 to 42 institutions participated in the U.S. This is just the U.S. 
um, the, there, there are education programs for Wikipedia in other countries. Um, and so we were part of um, the spring 2012 uh, iteration of this program. We were one of those institutions. Um, the institutions range from community colleges to four-year schools, state schools, private schools. It's a really wide range of colleges that participated in, in this U.S. program. And then in the second semester we participated in the spring, there were 23 campuses that had some sort of a Wikipedia um, assignment as part of this program officially and uh, representing 40 courses. So some institutions had more than one course. Um, and I just want to point out that there are people doing things like this, assign, uh, faculty assigning Wikipedia articles that are not part of the education program. They, they're just kind of on their own. We chose to join the ed education program because we liked the idea of having an ambassador, a Wikipedia ambassador. We liked the idea of getting materials and training. Um, and wanted to wanted to share within that. Okay, so um, this is a screenshot of uh, what's called a stub article on Wikipedia, a very short article. Um, I'm going to show you a before and an after. Um, this article is one that one of my students in spring 2012 chose to develop and research and write. Um, this is what it looked like the day before, or the you know the moment before he uploaded his work. He he before he started working on it. And this is the kind of thing that I wanted students to work with, an article. We, we tried to target articles that were very, very short. The longer an article is, the more developed it is on Wikipedia, the harder it is for students, especially freshmen, to find something that they can add to it. So the after is this link. So I'm going to click on it. And it should pull up the old version of this article. You'll see at the top this is an old revision. This isn't the article that's up there now because there have been edits since my student did it. But this is every version, every old version of Wikipedia articles are, are, are always available. So anyway, this is the work that my student did. So this, and this was you know, one of the better ones. Um, so basically we went from this to this. So you can see it's a, it's a nice little bit of, of content here and his sources, which he didn't totally do correctly down at the bottom, but it's sort of in the right ballpark as far as his sources. So this is what we were aiming for. Okay, so a little background. Um, maybe you may be familiar with this or not. Um, from Project Information Literacy Survey of 2010, this was a national survey of um, a couple dozen campuses, college students, sophomore through senior. Um, the, the numbers were about three quarters of college students do use Wikipedia at least occasionally. Um, I was surprised it was this low. Um, and then this is another interesting bit of data that I found um, when I was preparing for the ACRL conference. The Pew um, Research Center, which surveys adults, um, you know, does phone surveys, big national phone surveys, um, found that 69% of Internet users with a college degree use Wikipedia. Okay, this was a helpful phrase to me that I'm sharing here to, in terms of thinking about Wikipedia and higher ed and, you know, moving away from an attitude of being, it, considering it strictly verboten and, and um, under, you know, accepting that there's some use going on, this notion of an information ecosystem um, and that there are different layers of, or different levels of reliability or credibility and that Wikipedia is, is at the point where we, you know, we have to accept that it's, it's there, it's part of this ecosystem and, and how are we going to um, deal with it. And I took this phrase from a really interesting opinion story in the Chronicle of Higher Education that was written by the a publisher or a high-level executive at a scholarly, um, a scholarly press. I, I can't remember at the, off the top of my head who it was. Um, this is a fairly easy artic article to find that's actually listed in my sources at the end. Um, but I thought it, it, it was interesting that he basically, someone, a, a, a publisher that would, could be considered um, sort of a competitor or threatened, potentially threatened by Wikipedia, not only said that we needed to accept that it was part of academia, the ecosystem of academia, but also that it, um, he, rec he recommended or urged academics to contribute to Wikipedia to make it better. 
and his sort of vision of Wikipedia was as a portal, as a, as a starting place that um, could lead um, students, scholars to better sources um, you know, through their, their citations at the bottom, especially if academics started to make more contributions to Wikipedia. Okay, so here's, here's what we all know um, as far as the values of Wikipedia and how they overlap or diverge from uh, traditional scholarship. Um, we all know that Wikipedia um, often has anonymous authors and that they're typically often uncredentialed and that that's really a sort of a conflict with traditional scholarly values. Um, another way that it's very different that's sort of in Wikipedia's favor in a lot of ways is it's the quickness of editing it and updating it. Um, uh, peer review, the peer review process of course is not wiki or it's not quick. And so in, in that sort of in the uh, column of advantages I would say for Wikipedia as far as quickness compared to traditional scholarship. Here are some areas, I don't know if this is considered, would be considered controversial or not. I'm really curious to hear people's thoughts afterwards. Um, but I, as I, the more I learned about Wikipedia, the more I saw overlap between what we were trying to teach students and about the world of academia and the world of Wikipedia. Um, and what I'm going to talk about is, is more on the level of sort of theoretical, on the level of Wikipedia as reflected by its policies. And I'll describe those policies in a moment. Um, but I would say that according to Wikipedia's policies, there is a strong value placed on reliable cited sources. That may not be the reality of, of all or even most Wikipedia articles, but in their policies, their core policies, that is a, a strongly championed value um, that, does, um, that is compatible with traditional scholarship. Now, Wikipedia places a preference on more secondary sources, um, whereas traditional scholarship might privileged scholarly or primary sources, um, but both you know, overlapping in the sense of, of valuing reliable sources. Um, again, this could be something people disagree with me on. I would say that Wikipedia's model is a form of peer review. It's not credentialed reviewers. They're amateur reviewers, but it's a model of not a single author or not a single person responsible for something, but um, a, a model that allows for others to um, improve something through review. Um, obviously, it's a, a different process for a traditional peer review journal than, than the way Wikipedia works. But I would say the, no, the concept at its most basic level is peer review, just different types of peers. Okay, this is one area that I, again, as I learned more about Wikipedia, I was, I was really grateful to, uh, for it. And it, that's its extreme transparency. Um, I showed you a previous version of an article and mentioned that every article on Wikipedia um, is available. Every previous version of every article is always available. Very, very little gets ever deleted from Wikipedia. Um, they're also very um, transparent about their process of developing policies. And I would say that um, the Wikipedia process of knowledge creation or article creation is much more transparent than any other, you know, most other types of publication, peer review or, or popular news, news uh, article creation. So here are a couple of the key policies if you're interested in learning more about this. Um, they have what they call three core content policies. And these are policies that I ask my students to read at the beginning of the semester. One has, is called verifiability. And what I have on the screen here are the exact names of the policies. It can actually ironically be a little bit hard to find Wikipedia's policies. And the people who trained me at the Wikimedia um, headquarters, I, I was able to go there and get training um, to participate in this program, uh, confided that they often use Google Advanced Search to search Wikipedia for, for some of their uh, internal documents. Um, so this is the name of that policy that has to do with sourcing, um, neutral point of view, kind of the encyclopedic um, approach to knowledge as opposed to um, you know, some other types of articles. And then finally, a core uh, content policy is, is Wikipedia is not a place for original research. So just to elaborate on the verifiability policy, and like I said, this name at the top, if you were to search it exactly in this way on Wikipedia, you should be able to pull up this, this full policy. 
Um, Wikipedia's policy says that um, sources for articles should have these qualities, um, uh, and they define what they mean by reliable. It, it's, it's something that you, you would recognize as um, I worked for a newspaper before I was an academic librarian, and it, it struck me as a very kind of journalistic approach to um, sourcing and, and research. Um, they emphasize the importance of fact checking from any source um, and any kind of editorial oversight. Um, this notion of a third party source, meaning um, sources that are preferred on Wikipedia are not written by the subject of the article and also not written uh, and, and actually have a, um, a, a third party that uh, sort of uh, edits or evaluates. Um, I can give examples of that if anyone has any questions. And, the, and their third aspect of verifiability is that to be considered a verifiable source, it needs to be published in some way, um, which they define as meaning there is an archived copy somewhere online or in print. Okay, this notion of third party versus self-published, I found really useful in terms of explaining to students what um, would be considered good sources or reliable sources. Um, and it wasn't something that I believe I've ever seen in information literacy discussions or education or articles. Um, you know, we talk a lot about standard three and um, of, of the ACRL standards, um, but this was something that I felt students could really get or understand, this notion of self-publication whether it be a blog or a wiki or any kind of crummy self-published book, um, if it is crummy, um, being automatically or, or uh, considered less reliable than something that goes through an editorial process um, where the, the author is not writing about him or herself, um, and then there's a third party that actually reviews what the author has, has written. Um, this uh, section of the reliability um, policy is something I emphasized a lot with my students. And I think that it's really a, a practical kind of transferable standard to take um, for information literacy to take outside of just this Wikipedia assignment, just in terms of source evaluation in general. Okay, so I'm going to give you a quick little tour. I've, I've alluded to some areas of Wikipedia that, that are there that may not be that well known um, uh, that we did with my um, with my students needed to become more familiar with and that your students could as well as far as being more savvy users of Wikipedia. So I'm going to click on this picture. I have here an example article. This is a candy that's famous in Nashville. I was um, talking about this, this subject in Nashville, so I looked, looked up this Wikipedia page. Um, a lot of people aren't aware, I'm circling it with my cursor, that parallel to every single article on Wikipedia, and there are millions of them, I can't remember right now, it's 3 million or 8 million in, in the English language Wikipedia, is a talk page, which used to be, I think, called discussion or something. And this is a place where people who have disagreements or people who have questions about an article um, can post comments. And down here at the bottom, because this is such a short article and it's just a candy bar, there's not a lot of discussion, although there is one note here about a, a, dis, a disagreement about a date, and um, I'll talk more about that in a second. But what was really useful to my students was to see that on the talk page of any article um, is some useful information. One is a rating. Wikipedia has a rating system. I'll talk about that in a second. And this article is rated as a stub. Stub is the lowest rating. It's the shortest article, type of article on Wikipedia. And I, I asked my students to focus on finding a stub that they could expand. A stub or start. Start is the next, next longest uh, size of article. Also useful is this notion of projects or wiki projects. These are groupings of articles. These are like broad subject categories. And this candy bar article is part of uh, the wiki project called Food and Drink. It's also part of a second one called Brands. If I were to go back to um, this article, the main article, if I were to click on the word Nashville, just to show you a little bit longer article. You can see this is a much more develop, developed one. This is clearly more than a stub. My computer's a little slow here. Um, if we go to the talk page, it's 
kind of fun to do once you know it's there. So this is part of several wiki projects. It's part of Wiki Project Tennessee, Wiki Project Cities, um, and each project has its own rating, but they've rated it essentially the same. B class is, is sort of not the best and not the worst. Um, this is something I don't know if a lot of people realize that there are these rating systems. And like everything on Wikipedia, it's volunteer based. Um, and here's a lot more discussion. And here's actually some kind of a disagreement where people are formally labeling their comments either support or oppose. It has to do with moving, um, moving this, or maybe it was changing the name of, of, the, uh, of the article. So I, I would argue that, that these talk pages, when they're well developed, are um, a really great illustration of what we sometimes refer to as the scholarly conversation. You know, the notion that, you know, in the best cases, we try to teach students that knowledge isn't just a matter of facts, but it's uh, often the product of, of discussion and debate. And, and this is very visible on, on some of the more extensive Wikipedia pages. Another thing I'd like to show to you in this um, little under the hood is the history. Earlier in this talk, I showed you an old version of tramp trade, which is a shipping term that my student worked, one of my students worked on. Um, if you weren't aware of it, every single version of every article on Wikipedia has a history page. And every time an edit is made, it gets a new entry in this list. You can see that some of these are these. This column here is the author. This is an IP address, obviously, and this these are are the usernames of these um, of the the editors who did this. It's possible to um, to have an account on Wikipedia. All my students needed to have accounts. I have an account. Um, it's, there are many good reasons um, as far as being an editor on Wikipedia to have an account, and it's actually um, they told us that it's more private to edit on Wikipedia with an account um, than, than not, because if you don't use an account, if you don't log in and have an account name, then your IP address is recorded when you make edits, and that's probably less private than if you're Tishaboo or eScog. Um, if I wanted to see what, um, the ver what uh, this version of, of Nash the Nashville, Tennessee article looked like, all I need to do is click on a, that version, and it comes up. with a little warning at the top that says this is an old revision of the page. And, and if you need to or you want to, you are, it is possible to see how things um, change, see what edits were made. So this is what I mean by extreme transparency. Um, it's certainly not perfect. It's not even close to perfect uh, as a source, um, but it, it is transparent. <laughs> and you, you are able to see everything that, pretty much everything that's happened to an article from the beginning to the current day. So I'm going to go back to my slides because I think that's probably enough of, of the under the hood stuff. I think that the key thing I wanted people to see if you weren't familiar with it is this place of discussion that's attached to every single article and um, the, the history, the history tab or section for every single article. And here's the summary of those things. Um, I didn't show you my user page, but when you have a login, um, there's certain privileges that come with having a login. I think that um, if a person is very active on Wikipedia, they start to um, you know, get a little bit more respect the more edits they have. And many um, regular Wikipedians or, or Wikipedia authors um, will have a listing of all the articles they've worked on, and it could be seen as a type of a CV. Um, another term here is the sandbox. My students. Um, I encourage them, the, and Wikimedia encouraged us to encourage them to do a lot of their work starting out in, in their personal workspace. If you have an account on Wikipedia, um, you get your own kind of workspace, your own sandbox um, on the site. It's all open. None of it is private. There's very little space on Wikipedia that's, that's behind any kind of a password or, pri or area of privacy. Um, but you know, practically speaking, people typically aren't looking in other people's sandboxes. 
Um, the wiki projects I mentioned, this is, could be seen as a, a sort of amateur peer review. These are dedicated volunteers who um, assign article ratings um, to an area that they have you know, some interest in or, or possibly some expertise in. There were several wiki projects that my students had to choose from that were related to the maritime world um, because we're a maritime academy. There was, um, there's a maritime task force wiki project, et cetera. Um, the first semester I taught the class, we were working from shipwrecks, the wiki project for shipwrecks, and a uh, wiki project related to engineering disasters. Those were two that I came up with. Um, by the second semester that I taught the class, um, I had, I think, somewhere between 13 and 16 wiki projects that were actually generated by students, many that I never would have thought of. So that was, that was kind of an improvement, I would say. Um, we found many more broad categories that they could pick from to, to work on their article topics or their articles. Um, uh, let's see. So I think I've covered this here. This is a summary of the sections of Wikipedia you may not have been familiar with before. Okay, here's a breakdown of the article ratings. Um, not every article is rated, but I think that um, if someone starts a new one, it automatically gets a stub rating. Um, the, the shortest, least developed articles with few or no sources are stub or start, and it kind of goes up from there. You may have seen links on the front of Wikipedia's main page to featured articles. Um, the number of featured articles compared to the total is less than 0.1%. These are supposed to be the best of the best. These are supposed to be the, uh, within any broad category, any broad project, the editors that work on, on the, um, those articles um, ha have certain guidelines, again, sort of volunteer derived um, guidelines that, that uh, cause an article to be assigned an FA or a featured article rating, which is supposed to be the best. There's some, um, dis you know, sometimes some disagreement about on whether or not they really are the best. Um, but this, this is the theory at least. Okay, here if you were to go to say Wiki Project Shipwrecks and you were to scroll the main page of, of that um, section, you would see at some point a colorful grid like I have here. This is, um, this is the Wiki Project Energy. This is a very big project with many, many articles. You can see in the lower right cor hand corner there are over 16,000 articles on Wikipedia that have been grouped into this volunteer project called Energy. Um, you can see on the left the ratings. Here's Stub, Start, here's Featured Articles. There are currently 10 Energy-related articles that have been given the, the highest r rating. Um, this grid, this colorful grid, is, was very much what I and my students used to help find articles in areas they were interested in. And every number here is hyperlinked. So if my students said they were interested in energy um, topics, then a, a starting place for them to find article, an article they could work on would be to click on this number 4,933, which is the total number of energy stubs on Wikipedia. So you can see there's no shortage of articles that need work. And, and certainly a small number that have risen to the very top. Um, so it's kind of like a to-do list. It's also for the featured articles, it's kind of a brag list. These are the Wiki Project volunteers' um, best, you know, sort of the best of their project listed here. Okay, so this is a Venn diagram that was on one of my handouts for my students' assignment, and I thought it was useful to share. Um, Basically, to find a good project to work on on Wikipedia, um, you need an, a stub or a start article that needs your help. Um, it's going to be a lot harder to improve an article that's higher, more highly rated. But it, you also need, it needs to also be an article for which there's good coverage, for which the, the student can find third-party reliable sources. And there are many stub or start class articles that are tough nuts to research. They're, they're not they aren't necessarily well covered in third-party sources. So this light blue area is kind of the, over, the, the, the good zone. These are the articles that satisfy both requirements um, and wh where I encourage students to focus their efforts. And they, that meant they needed to do some preliminary searching, that they might see a stub article that they liked and wanted to, to work on, um, and they needed to run it through some article databases and find out if there were any books on the subject and look in news, look in, uh, news sources for coverage to make sure they, that they could actually find something. 
Okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about how it went. I'm going to start with just a couple more anecdotal things, and then I'll share my assessment data with you. Um, this is all, all my data and um, stories for the most part from the first semester. I, I still need to kind of pull together the second semester's information. One of the assignments we did in, in our class in 2012 was have students do what I called a reflective PowerPoint. So it was like a graphical dis discussion of what their process was like at being editors on Wikipedia. And maybe, maybe sometimes um, they talked about how their perspective of Wikipedia changed. So that's what I've got here is one piece of a graphic one of my student cre uh, students created for his assignment on PowerPoint. Um, and this was his original perspective of Wikipedia, which I think you might recognize um, as many students' perspective of Wikipedia in terms of research. They start with a topic, they check the topic on Wikipedia to get general information and search terms, and then they go off and do a Google search. This is sort of my engineering student's flow chart of his original perspective. So after this assignment, this is his, um, his visualization or his graphical description of his, of his research process and his view of Wikipedia. You can see here, because he had picked a topic that wasn't well covered on Wikipedia, he couldn't use Wikipedia in that way, a way that many of us use you know, as a kind of preliminary source. He had to bypass it and figure out um, background and general information and search terms fr from other places. He says here his brain, um, you know, I think that a lot of the students were sort of forced into more traditional sourcing and research um, tools because they couldn't use Wikipedia in, this, in, their, in their usual way. And, and um, basically what I like about this diagram is it shows that when Wikipedia is kind of the end point, um, that there's a lot more research that needs to happen, a lot more opportunity to learn about, um, you know, other other search tools, um, you know, uh, pulling together multiple sources, not just relying on Google, et cetera. It's, it becomes more, um, I, I would argue, more sophisticated searching happening in, in the best cases. Okay, here's my second anecdote. I had a, a great student who um, worked on the article, the Wikipedia article related to yacht racing, and he was so excited to work on this because um, he had another topic at first, and he stumbled across by accident the yacht racing, actually I think it was one of our assignments it, that he, where he discovered the yacht racing article, and he had some experience with yacht racing. And his, in his opinion, the Wikipedia article was so bad that, um, that he was outraged you know, in, a, in a mild kind of way and, and changed his topic and wanted to make the article better. So he was really motivated to improve this article that he thought was so crummy originally on Wikipedia, and he did a real good job. I was very proud of him. And then, but then he took this photo, one of some of our students uploaded images to Wikipedia, and he, he uploaded this beautiful um, reproduction of a painting. Um, and, and then a week later, after it was turned in, um, he came by my office to tell me you know, two things. Um, within the week of having submitted, you know, of, of having uh, uploaded his, his new, the new article, some other editors had gone in and cleaned up his writing a little bit. I think they had like maybe tweaked his first paragraph and maybe changed a, a citation style or something. And he was really excited about that. That was kind of cool to me that he didn't see that as a negative, but he thought it was neat that someone actually saw his work and made it a little bit better. The other thing he, showed, he told me about was, that his photo had been removed because it had failed Wikipedia's copyright policy. And that's another thing I wanted to briefly mention is that um, images are really fun to upload if, you can, if your students can find a good one to add to, to their article. I think a lot of students like to do that. But Wikipedia is actually very strict. Um, I think they're worried about being sued or they, you know, they don't want to get in trouble. And so they have very strict not only policies, but they actually have bots and little automated programs that go through and check. Um, you know, I don't know a lot of detail about that, but that's my understanding is that there's a lot of automated checking that goes on of the images that are uploaded. And so that was, that was a good learning experience, I think, for my student um, to not be quite so cavalier about copyright. Okay, so um, my data, the data that we used to figure out if this was a, a good way to teach or not, or a good, a good way for students to, to improve their information literacy. I have this photo. This is a photo of actually what I'm looking at right now. This is a photo from my desk. And it's important because you can see 
that my, my office is right behind the circulation desk. We don't really have a reference desk. We have a help service desk. And when students need help from the librarians, we're there, we can see them, a student assistant sort of waves to us. And our doors are open and we can hear what's going on as well. But the point is I can see w sort of what's happening in the library. We're a very, very small library. I can see you know, students that are standing there. So I noticed sort of anecdotally it seemed like there were a lot more of my Live 100 students showing up in the library. I was, they just were there. It seemed like I was seeing them more than I was used to seeing them, standing at the circulation desk, checking things out, picking up interlibrary loans. This little area right here by my coworker Mark is where the interlibrary loan pickups are held. So it, I decided, and I'll give some more rationale in a second, to take a look at um, some type of, I wanted to look at circulation and I wanted to look at interlibrary loan. And here, here's my thought process. Um, at the same time that I was doing this Wikipedia project, I was working on the latest project information literacy study that had to do with the workplace. Um, we interviewed employers and talked to them about what they saw in recent college grads. And one thing that kept coming up was a sense from employers that they wanted grads who would be able and willing to go deeper with their research. And they used the word persistence. We coded for various things. And one sort of thing that sort of rose to the top was this quality of persistence. Um, employers want grads who are persistent when they're information seeking. And that kind of informed how I decided to assess the Wikipedia project. Um, uh, and, and, this, and this definition here of, of what I mean or what they meant by persistence, um, it, it would sometimes come out in from employers in terms of wanting grads that were able and willing to use a variety of sources and, and understanding that information seeking was iterative, that it's not just one search and you're done, that you often have to refine and reflect just like we all know in the research process, process in the college environment. And so what I decided to do, to, I, I, I had this sense that this project, this Wikipedia assignment, maybe for some students was more motivating, that they maybe, may, I wondered if were they going deeper you know, with their research, with their sources. And so how I decided to measure that was um, research practices, one in particular. Um, I did a citation analysis of their sources to look at variety, to look at different how many different types of sources were they using. And we, I also had a student survey for one section. So the most inconvenient library service, if we were all in person, I'd pause here and have you shout out what you think the most inconvenient library service is. Um, I think that one of the most inconvenient for students or uh, maybe less likely to be used is interlibrary loan. Um, and what I have here is um, a, a chart that shows I looked at interlibrary loan borrowing rates just for LIB 100 students. So just these freshmen taking this class, you know, in that semester that they took the class, I looked at how many of them did an, inter, did an interlibrary loan or requested an interlibrary loan. And you can see that the Wikipedia semester, the spring 2012, a lot more did request interlibrary loans. I mean, of course, there are many things that could have contributed to this. Um, in this area right here, between this semester and this semester, we made our interlibrary loan service more visible on the website. That may be, may be why this went up here. But this semester here, I'm circling with the 22% is, is my student, the students who were working on a Wikipedia assignment. Their loans may or may not have had anything to do with their assignment. It could have been for other classes. Um, but I thought this was an interesting indicator of possibly going deeper. And, and my idea of persistence and going deeper and inconvenience, it's not that we want it to inconvenience the students. It's just that by its nature on our campus, Interlibrary loan requires students to um, use, at this time, they had to use a special database, WorldCat. They had to put in the request and wait. They had to come back to the library. Um, and compared to most of their choices in terms of finding information, interlibrary loan is pretty darn inconvenient. It's, it's definitely delayed gratification. And so I am saying that it could be seen as a marker of greater persistence. Um, just sort of a hypothesis, I guess, at this point with, with a small sample. 
and I'll certainly be looking at this for spring 2013. And I wanted to show you one more chart. Not only were the percent, was the percent of students who used the service up, but the number of requests per student um, was up as well. Okay, so I did the citation analysis of the sources that they used in their um, Wikipedia articles. Unfortunately, I didn't have anything really good to compare it to um, because I, I, the assignments were so different, it didn't feel fair to compare um, a bibliography where they were required to have a certain number of books and require, you know, it was very spelled out for them, the, the level of variety um, in previous assignments, whereas in this assignment, the Wikipedia assignment, I did not tell, I did not dictate any variety or any source type. It was just essentially through the semester, here are the tools, here are the ways that we find them, um, and then for their final project, they were, they were making their own choices. So I thought that this, without being able to compare, I thought this sort of level of variety was, was decent for a freshman research project. I, I divided the, I assigned categories, um, and I, I assigned basically 10 different categories, 10 different types of sources, you know, books, government websites, commercial websites, um, journal articles, magazine articles, et cetera. I had 10 categories, and there was an average of three categories per article. In, um, for my student Wikipedia articles. But something that came out when I did this that I wasn't expecting was that, one, that the largest number of, of all the sources that were used, books were the most common type of source. And I, I could say very confidently that that's not how it typically is in Live 100 um, if students have a choice. Or in general, in the student research papers that I see, that books would be way down near the bottom, at least on our campus, as far as the type of source that students gra are gravitating to. Um, so this was very surprising that two-thirds, fully two-thirds of their sources were books. Um, it wasn't that they had three different types of websites. The, the variety level included a, a high number of books. And I, I thought this was possibly another marker of persistence if books are are more inconvenient for students to use as a source than, say, uh, uh, a, an online source. Okay, so here are the two questions I asked. I'm almost done here. The two questions I asked on the survey I gave to one section. I did the survey a little differently in spring 2013, and I, I think it will be more rigorous, but this is just what I did kind of off the cuff um, at the end of the semester as a, more as a teacher than as a researcher. Um, just asking them to reflect on how the publicness of their assignment, the, you, what I've called the authenticness of the assignment and the audience, how did they think that it impacted the, the quality of their work and how um, their level of effort, et cetera. And was it something kind of affectively that they liked or they didn't like? Um, and so kind of grouping their responses together, they reported a um, little bit more than half, about half, um, saw it as having a, either a positive affect, meaning that they liked it, they liked writing for a public audience on Wikipedia, or whether they liked it or not, they thought it impacted them positively in terms of their level of effort. Um, that first semester, there were definitely a, a certain number of students that did not like it, and they did not see it as a, having a positive impact. And then some might have said, well, yes, I liked it, but it didn't cause me to do better work. It didn't give me a, you know, I didn't, it didn't it motivate me to do a higher quality of work. That's why these add up to more than 100 percent, or they could check as many boxes as they wanted. Um, let's see here. So th thinking a little bit about that negative number, you know, that, that significant minority of students who didn't consider it a positive experience, here are some of my thoughts. And some of the things I worked on in the second semester to try and make it better is that for some students, especially freshmen, it's actually not motivating to think that you're doing something real or public. It's actually intimidating. And a couple of students told me directly that they didn't feel comfortable um, doing work that uh, uh, anybody could see. Um, some students, their negative experience had to do with having a hard time finding an article to work on. And I think that got better the second semester because, um, because we had so many more categories for them to choose from. And I had fewer students kind of pulling their hair out, saying I can't find a stub to work on or, or find a stub that actually has sources I can use. Uh, but this is definitely one of the hardest parts of the assignment, if you're thinking about doing it, um, is, is actually finding a workable stub to work on. Another challenge, maybe for other students different than my students, but 
maybe upper division students is that the style of writing on Wikipedia is not like your typical college paper. And if you have a sophomore, junior, senior, and many of the education program courses were upper division. We were, I think, in the minority being a freshman class. If you have an upper division student who's used to doing very well in the typical college paper, they may actually not like this at all, or it may be very challenging for them to have to write in this style. And then finally, um, especially my second semester, a lot of students um, really wanted to write about companies, small companies, or new technologies, they want, and they wanted to start an article from scratch. I had a lot more of that my second semester, and I was very open to it. But in order to um, create a new article on Wikipedia, there's this um, another sort of core policy is notability. It needs to, it needs to have enough written about it in third-party sources to deserve its own article. And I had some students that um, really, really wanted to write about companies um, whose articles ultimately got deleted, not permanently. I mean, you can always see the old versions, but they, weren't, they didn't stick around because they didn't meet the notability requirement. So if you have students that want to create a new article, this is, this is a pretty big little hurdle since Wikipedia has been around for a while, um, is, is, is getting over the notability hurdle. So here's my aligning with the ACRL standards. Um, these are tasks on the left column uh, to this assignment, and, and I would argue strongly that um, this assignment meets all of the ACRL standards. Um, it's, it's a little different flavor maybe than the usual assignment, um, but definitely I think it's compatible with these standards. And then if you don't teach a class, if you don't teach a, a, a credit-based course, but um, are thinking about how you might do, or even if you do, thinking about how you might do this in a scaled down way, not committing your whole semester to it. Um, some ideas that were smaller assignments in my class, um, we started by having students simply um, find articles that maybe needed some work and just make recommendations of sources, not necessarily writing the article themselves or writing the update um, or the expansion, but just on the talk page, the place of discussion, putting a citation and, and justifying why they thought the article would benefit from some additional material from this source. So recommending sources, potential sources. Um, we did an assignment where my students compared an article on Wikipedia in the maritime realm with articles in our Oxford Encyclopedia of Maritime History. And I think that was a pretty good assignment. Um, and you could do something similar with any subject-specific encyclopedia. Um, and then finally, I have heard of other of classes that um, that create graphics or images, you know, more art-type classes. But you could do a, a search kind of a um, exercise, I think, where students could find uh, images or create maybe infographics for the Wikimedia Commons, which is the name of the part of Wikipedia where all the images are are stored. Okay, that's it. Um, before I rest here on questions, I'll just tell you that the next slide are my sources. Um, the ACRL proceedings I wrote for this presentation has many, many, many more sources, of course, um, but these are just the ones that I mentioned, the sources I mentioned today. So I'm going to stop talking. I've been talking for a long time and see if anybody has anything they want to ask about or comment on. Hi, Michelle, we do have a bunch of questions here. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, great. Um, one of the first questions we got is, uh, is Wikipedia education program available for high school students? Well, I don't, I'm pretty sure I should go, I could look right now. It's not that hard to, again, they're totally transparent. It's not hidden away anywhere. You can go right onto Wikipedia and look up the education program. In my ACRL paper, there's a, um, a link, a couple of different links to sections. I, I'm 99% um, I'm certain that it's very college focused, and I, I don't know if it's explicitly college focused or just that's who ended up there. I think that to do a full article on Wikipedia would be, would be a, a good challenge for a high school student. I think I sometimes wonder if it's appropriate for freshmen in college. So formally, I think the answer is no. I think formally um, the education program is very focused on higher ed. Okay. Okay, great. Um, and uh, where can uh, people find out more about getting trained as a Wikipedia educator? 
again, the Wiki you know what, let me see if I can pull it up. I'm going to pull it up uh, the page. It's the Wikipedia Education Program, I think on the main front page has, um, you know, interested in getting involved, that sort of thing. So just a second. Okay, great. Let's see, it's going gonna, it's gonna to fail me. Yeah, it's hard to see. It says it doesn't exist. <laughs> I think I need to go Wikipedia. Everything in what they call the Wikipedia space. Here it is. Starts with a prefix Wikipedia and then colon. So here we go. Outreach Wikipedia Education Program. Okay, so this is it's outreach.wikimedia.org, and from there you can probably get to this page. Um, background. Contact us. In here somewhere, I know I've seen a page that says, are you interested in, part oh, here we go. See this page if you're interested in participating as a professor, ambassador, or something else. So it's all there. Um, uh, Outreach.wikimedia.org is a good starting place. Okay, great. Thanks so much. And we'll make sure to send uh, this link around too when we send around the okay. recording of the presentation. Okay, um, okay so, so thank you for that. Uh, the next question I have here is, um, how did your students view the quality of the peer review process of Wikipedia, considering it was um, untraditional or non-traditional? Uh, did, did that come up in conversation as well? And what did they think about it? You mean um, the process, the, like did they think that the peer review process was not very good because it resulted in articles that are generally not terrific? Is that, is that? Right, yes, yeah. You know, yeah. I think, you know, I I think it really will vary by campus. I mean, my students, this is a kind of a hands-on school that is very technical, and I think my students were kind of, I think a lot of them were kind of blown away by all the kind of behind the scenes activity happening on Wikipedia and um I think that in if I had to choose, I'd say there were more of them were impressed by that process than turned off or you know, skeptical or whatever at another school that could be different. I think that I, I worked with another CSU librarian who's done some similar things with in her classes where her students had more some negative experiences with posting work that got deleted and and seeing it negatively for that reason, that, that it right. maybe cap capricious or arbitrary, some, had some experiences with what they felt were capricious or arbitrary editors. Or I think that's why the ambassador program is a good one because it can help, you know. There are ways, I think, to, to minimize that ex kind of experience, but it's definitely a possibility that that can happen. Nothing like that happened with my class, N neither. Student. Okay. Okay, great. Um, and then, uh, what kind of sources did your students usually use to edit their work was another question. Um, and I think they were referring to uh, when you were talking about how in scholarly research there it, it's general practice to use more primary sources, um, whereas Wikipedia is looking for more secondary or credible sources. Um, yeah. Did you see, um, what were your students mostly using? Well, I mean, I had that great big 64%. That, I mean, 64% of the total number of sources they used were books. So that, that's, right. a, that's a lot. Um, they right. definitely still relied on websites a lot. Um, you know, I I, I kind of broke that category into like like w government websites, websites from other countries was another category. Um, new like commercial like things that were strictly commercial or advocacy or um, that sort of thing. Educational websites. I would say I was disappointed that they were still so. Um, you know, so reliant, I guess, on Google. Um, I would have liked to have seen more. But you know, it was a mix. I guess it was a mix. I mean, some of the web sources they used were still disappointing, like I've seen in previous semesters, and some were actually great. I mean, they were great, perfect, you know, appropriate sources. I didn't have a problem with them actually seeking out primary sources. Again, that would have been a big leap and maybe more of an issue for a, a class at another campus of upper, you know, seniors who are used to doing that, who would have to break that habit. My students didn't have right. that habit yet. Okay, great. Um, and then uh, the student uh, with the yacht, the yacht sailing uh, really liked that his article was um, edited. But what 
uh, did the other say about it? Did they feel proprietary about the content that they were putting out there? Um, or did they have the same experience that they were excited when it was edited? Well, I mean, m many students, you know, they finished and then I never talked to them again. <laughs> you know, or they, you know, they left the right. semester. It was at the end of the semester. But the few that I have talked to since, I would say that I didn't hear anybody complain about it. I, I, you know, I had in my second semester, I had two students who wrote about companies that got severely edited or deleted because they didn't meet notability requirements or whatever. They didn't have good sources. But I didn't talk to those students after that happened. And I assured them that I could still see their article and grade it according to my own standards. Um, but the, there was a handful that, um, that were hap excited. Like it made, I, think it, I think this to me is the student that is motivated by, having, by doing something that matters or doing something that people are really going to read and not just rehashing something for the teacher. Those students, I would say, probably think it's cool and exciting. And I, I didn't have any student who felt that they did such good work that how dare anybody edit it. I think more of like sort of my top students, students that would typically often get an A, were, were actually feeling a little bit like an awareness of how little they knew and like how could I possibly do this? Um, and I'm so glad that you know it can continue to be improved. That I would say if I had to, that that would be the tendency of those that I talk to. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, and then one of the other questions we had was: um, Were students posting um, under a pseudonym, or was their name actually out there um, when they were editing these articles? Well, I told them it was up to them uh, that I needed okay. to know. I needed to know their handle, basically. But that if they didn't want to use their full name, I absolutely didn't want them to use their full name. So I had, you know, Power Dude 22 or whatever. You know, I had all kinds of pseudonyms. Right. Okay, great. Um, and then one of the other questions we had here was, sorry, let me just scroll up just one second. Um, does your uh, campus use LibGuides was one of the questions. Yes, we do. Okay. Okay. Um, and then the second part of that question was, um, what do you think the main benefit is of, and this was during the interlibrary loan um, conversation, um, what is sort of the main benefit of using um, sources outside versus using sources um, from inside your library? Like, what, like, like, um, is that question? I guess answered? why is why there is more it, valuable? Why is there, to, well, um, I don't think that there's automatic. I don't think that there's inherently any more value to it. In fact, if there were too much interlibrary loan going on, then I'd be thinking we need to beef up our collection in that area. But I saw it as a reflection of persistence. I was thinking about this notion of going deeper, this notion of trying harder or working, not just sort of do, going through the motions or not just doing the minimum they needed to to get the assignment done. Something that might reflect a little passion. You know, when I'm excited about a research project and I go sort of to the ends of the earth or whatever, something to reflect that. So I, it's an indirect reflection of, a, of an internal uh, affective process, I would say. And so there's nothing inherent about interlibrary loan that's good or bad. It's just, does it reflect that? Does it reflect trying harder? You know, one thing I'll mention that I put in my ACRL paper that I thought was interesting, there's not that much research on interlibrary loan as far as what I could tell, especially as far as these issues in information literacy. But there was, is a study, it hasn't been published yet, but I put the preprint link in my ACRL paper of a, it's a large study of Canadian universities, and they, they were able to correlate interlibrary loan activity with, um, uh, I, can't, I think it's publication. Like basically the more an institution publishes, the more faculty at an institution publishes, the more they use interlibrary loan. I'm pretty sure that's what it was. So I saw it as oh, another possible connection with more serious research requires higher levels of interlibrary loan. Just sort of like going further, going deeper, trying, you know, trying the more obscure, you know, or more inconvenient places or whatever. I mean, it's right. just, it's a hypothesis, you know, I don't it's not true. 
Right. Um, I can certainly understand that just from my own personal experience, both as an undergraduate and a grad student. So I definitely uh, agree with that thinking and that hypothesis on that. Um, and then uh, we did have one, uh, one last question. Um, what kind of projects can you suggest for um, high school students? And I thought a lot of the um, smaller projects that you were talking about might be appropriate for high school students as well, but I just wanted to see what your thoughts on that were. I think there's so much possibility. Um, I think that to show a high school student to take an article that they are interested in and to show them the evolution of that article somehow, like th through the talk page conversation, through the history, um, something, I mean, I, maybe it's above high school, I don't know, this notion of knowledge kind of being battled over as opposed to just being true or not true, um, that seems like it would be interesting. We at um, I, there was the, the head of the outreach program, uh, Rod something, I have to go look up his name, maybe I can include that in the other material, spoke at the CCLI conference, the California um, Conference on Library Instruction. And he did give an example of going to a high school in California and talking to them about Wikipedia. Um, I think it would be worth poking around on the outreach page, the Wikimedia outreach page, to look for any high school related projects. I'm, I, I'm probably just not familiar with them. They may, they may exist. Um, and I think it would be worth you know, maybe even Googling to see if anybody else in high school, in the high school world, is using Wikipedia in that way. But I think, you know, I think just kind of the under the hood stuff, like how is Wikipedia, um, you know, how does it, exist? How does it come, how do articles come into being, you know, to, sh to see the evolution of an article, to see disagreements about, um, about um, knowledge. And, and I think you could in high school do a comparison. If, the, if it was a class, a history class, where the students had reliable information as kind of their base, base level, and then see what, you know, see what is in the Wikipedia article uh, on, on that, to do a comparison in that way, I think would could be a, a high school assignment. I'm sorry I can't offer more. I um, no, I think that's great. With that. Right, right. Yeah, definitely. Um, no, that's very helpful. Um, and Allison Head, who's actually on the call with us as well, just uh, oh, cool. shared your um, ACRL paper as oh, well. Great. So she okay. put that in the chat box. Um, oh, so thank you for doing that, Allison. Okay. Uh, and then um, we mostly just have a lot of comments now. Um, we actually had someone who said, um, yes, thank you. This is a great in-depth look. Um, sorry, that just went away. Um, look at using Wikipedia for good instead of terrifying our students into <laughs> never using it. So I thought that was a great comment. Um, and we also had someone who said, um, best learning session I've had in months. Thank you for so effectively sharing your fantastic experience. So, and I would like to concur with that. So um, thanks so much, Michelle. And um, if anyone has any other questions for myself or Michelle, um, please let us know. And um, you can uh, send me an email um, or, uh, and we'll pass that information on to Michelle to, so she can get an answer back to you. Uh, thanks so much everyone for your time. Uh, and again, we'll be making sure to send out this recording as well as a PDF of Michelle's presentation. Uh, so thanks again so much, Michelle. This was a really great session. Sure thing. Thank you. I'll be in touch with All right. the materials. Okay, great. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.